Good morning. Well, first I want to thank the uh, organizer and for inviting me. And they uh, not only invite me to give a tutorial, they also give me the honor of organizing some sessions. And as later I thought that was a very clever way of organizing a meeting, you know, just inviting a speaker, then ask them to organize more sessions. And I did. I, uh, so any uh, sessions you see a sort of fun title, that's a session that I helped to uh, organize. Um, so tomorrow we have, uh, I think, four or five sessions. And I thank all my uh, fellow uh, Monte Carlo you know, friends and the colleagues to uh, join me. So tomorrow we have this whole um, you know, session, uh, uh, multiple sessions. And uh, um, obviously, you know, I promised the publisher that I'm going to advertise this handbook. And it's coming out. And it's, it's not on the market yet. They're just uh, doing the final galley proof. But Amazon.com already uh, advertised with 32% discount. I don't know where, how they did it. So, um, <clears throat> the, the, so the uh, uh, publisher told me to make sure mention that get on Amazon.com. And uh, so this is a, this is a sort of a, a attempt to uh, update that uh, uh, Monte Carlo MCMC in practice, that book, uh, 1995. But this is with four different you know, authors and uh, editors. And uh, uh, Galen, uh, Gal Galen's here, too. Where are you? He's the one who did all the work. The rest of us just enjoy being there. And uh, so I appreciate that. And uh, there are multiple uh, authors of the chapters are here as well. OK. So um, what I'm going to do today, um, I'm actually going to perform today. As I promised, it's a, it's a live performance. And that actually requires the audience uh, participation. So trying to uh, come a little bit closer. I will also have two gorgeous assistants to help me at, at some point. And so uh, you will see who they are. They're, they're, they're preparing at this moment. Um, to entice everybody to stay here uh, for the whole 90 minutes, which is not easy, I'm going to bribe you. All right? OK, so I'm going to bribe you. Um, I think uh, the Chinese New Year was uh, February 5th. Was it February 5th? Four. Four. So this is still during the Chinese Spring Festival time. We usually celebrate. We, we eat all the time. So we will eat seven days. So this is still within that seven-day period. And uh, uh, there is a grand Chinese tradition of giving out these, uh, for the Chinese, you know what I'm talking about, these red envelopes. OK? So during this. Uh, uh, performance, I will actually have audience participation. And uh, I will tell you a criteria that one of them, you will, be ab you will come here to play a Monty Hall problem with me. You guys know Monty Hall problem? OK. One of the envelope contains real money, real hard US dollar. I'm not going to tell you how much it is, but it's, it's a prime number. OK. <laughs> <laughs> two digits. It's not a one digit. All right. The other two envelope. One has a, a piece of advice from me. The other has assigned my business car. <laughs> All right? OK. So uh, you know, for that lucky ones, you know, you're going to play here. I'm going to ask you to do the, I thought it would be appropriate for Monte Carlo to do a Monte Hall. So, but we'll do that in the end. OK. So um, this uh, uh, tutorial actually has two parts. The first part is probably the more fun part, which is really I'm going to show you some movies, see how this MCMC works. The second part is more the sort of the uh, current research part and build upon the first part why, why MCMC is so useful, but it's also so dangerous. So that's basically the theme of today. I'm going to show you, for those of you who have never done MCMC, how many of you have, have uh, uh, programmed MCMC run your, yourself? How many of you are sure, for those who raised hand, you have done it correctly? <laughs> All right, good. I, I see a few hard lines here. OK, so for those who have not done it or have never heard of it, I'm going to show you how powerful this thing is, why this thing is all over the place. But though for those who have done it, I'm going to show you, you probably have done all wrong. It's, it just <laughs> is so dangerous. And, and uh, well, a few of my friends, they have seen me do, doing this before. So you, you, can, you can fall asleep as long as you don't snore, OK? Um, so um, the, as I said, the title is a Full Monte Carlo, a live performance, and with stars. And the stars, are, I'm going to tell you who, who the stars are later, OK? Not, not for the first part. And you will see some Chinese in this uh, presentation. It's a, a 
not because of Chinese New Year, because the first time I developed develop these slides, I was giving a tutorial to, uh, uh, to a Fudan University where I graduate for their centennial, so I left these sort of Chinese there. And uh, also for those people who um, understand the Chinese, you know, this is the correct way of writing my Chinese name. Do not write the little beauty, okay? That's, that's, the, the Chinese will get the joke, but not the rest. Um, what I regard my microchip Monte Carlo is really a workhorse for the modern scientific computation. This is a more sort of uh, elaborated uh, uh, abstract. You don't have to read it. Basically, uh, it basically tells you that uh, uh, what I'm to today is to uh, give you this, this sort of uh, quick overview of the two ma most basic algorithms, the Gibbs sampler and the Metrop Hastings. For, for the expert in the audience, and, and some of you would argue that they're actually really one algorithm, you know, give samples, special case of metropolis hasting, and vice versa, and, uh, but that's only for the, for, for the specialist. So uh, again, there will be, you know, Chinese, for those people who are studying Chinese, it's a good time for you to uh, review your, your how, how good your Chinese is. Um, the, I'm gonna basically list all these areas where MCMC has been used without any sort of ex exaggeration. Uh, this is all these sort of natural science. You have physics, chemistry. You know, actually, I list them at the very top because the microchip Monte Carlo was really discovered, de developed, uh, you know, uh, originally in, in statistical physics uh, more than now it's 60 years ago. Okay, and they've been applied to all sorts of stuff. In fact, uh, I list astronomy the sir because the stars I'm going to talk about is really because we were using it for these astronomy problems. So this is for sort of for natural engineering, and then you know gradually it has been used uh, a lot more in probably starting about around 1990 or late uh, late 1980. It started getting to sociology, education, psychology, and this is a place whenever people do the basings, you need to do the computation. You end up you know say well here's the MCMC, you can do something. You can write papers, you can get tenure, you know that kind of stuff. Um, then, of course, you know, it's all getting to uh, in, uh, economics, finance, and we know how fiasco that has been, uh, but we're not going to talk about that. And, uh, you know, it's all these areas I listed here literally have used, not just sort of lightly used, that people have seriously used these, these algorithms. Okay. So why the algorithm becomes so popular and what it can do. So I want to show you this as an interesting uh, recent, and uh, five, six years ago, we had uh, a graduate student who wrote a thesis. And the title of his thesis was Microchip Monte Carlo Applications in Biophysics and Astrophysics. When I saw that title, I said, great. You know, I'm also department chair. I said, this is a great title. I can show the dean, all right? Because I'm, I'm going to tell the dean, look at what we're doing. Well, we're doing bioinformatics, which is the smallest unit you can find in the universe, right? You study gene everything. Then also we're doing astrophysics, which is the largest scale. Uh, so, so the next slide is the one I actually used to uh, make the presentation in front of my deans, trying to get more money for the department. And so I asked the question, you know, statisticians like to take average, but this guy was studying, uh, you know, both the, uh, uh, that's the DNA, that's the uh, nippler, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, the stars. Both has this uh, double helix type of, you know, uh, um, shape. And I asked my deans a question. Uh, guess where did the student go after he graduated? He studied bioinformatics and astronomy. Where did he go? That's where he went. <laughs> so, so the right size is about 2.5 by 6, and, um, and, and, and some are here. And so, um, okay, so that was uh, sort of just basically to show that if you have that tool, you can go anywhere. So that's a good news for all the graduate students. Okay. So now let me... Um, say what Monte Carlo has been used, why it becomes, why it's so popular. Well, I guess the first application, which probably the most well-known one, is integration, right? Suppose we want to compute such integration. Now, I don't have to say to this audience why integration is important, right? If you don't understand, you're in the wrong audience. Right? So, um, so you're doing this integration. Suppose you can write integration in this form, Basically, it's sort of with respect to a probability density. You can always write that one. Even if you don't have one, there's a you know, well-known technique called important sampling. You can always write against a particular probability, uh, a density. And the idea here is that if you can sample from that p a particular probability density, then you can just do it uh, by doing simple average, right? Doing simple 
um, you know, because of the law of large number, right? That's what, uh, that's what essentially the most sort of straightforward, uh, uh, no, in some sense, naive application of the Monte Carlo draws. There are many fancy variations of these control variations, uh, uh, control variates and uh, uh, antithetic you know, variates. There's all sorts of other fancy things. But uh, by, by the end of the day, you can always rewrite essentially as saying the sample average converged to the population average. Okay, so that's essentially why you can see this. This is very, very useful as long as you you make these draws. Let's see if this one works. Yeah, if these draws are coming from the density you want, probably slightly less well. Well, probably not slightly more. Like much less well known is the use of uh, Monte Carlo in optimization problem. Right, so Monte Carlo was taking a sample for doing integration, taking average. That seems obvious. So how could it be used for optimization? Well, um, imagine this is the function that you want to uh, maximize. Right, imagine this function is, you know, let's say it's positive. If it's not positive, you can always find the lower bound. As long as the lower bound, you can sort of make it a, looks like this. Right. So the idea is that if I can take a power of this guy, taking you know lambda equal one, lambda equal two. The more power you take, this is hard to control, uh, then what happened is the difference between these two peaks become more exaggerated, right? One peak gets you know, higher, the other gets pushed down, right? It's a relative thing. And uh, uh, I think if, for people who don't understand Chinese, I said here, Liang Jifenghua, it's, it's just uh, English probably is the, uh, is the polarization. The rich become richer, richer, and the poor become poor, right? It's, it's sort of, but why, what's, why does it important? Well, Imagine that you can actually sample from this distribution, right? Suppose, suppose you can draw from this distribution. If you make that into distribution, then most of the draws will be around this area, right? That helps you to localize where the, where the maximizer is. Now, you don't use, my MCM, you don't use Michael Chen, um, even just Monte Carlo itself, to find exactly what the maximizer is, but it helps to localize. Then you can do your fancy algorithm, you know, um, Genetic algorithm, you know, whatever you want to do. Because these algorithms, Newton Raphson, whatever you want to do. The problem with these algorithms, usually, you know, if, if they get trapped in these local uh, modes. So if you have these, if there are ways to zoom in into these areas which um, you know, has most action, that's, that's useful, right? So that's sort of the, uh, that's sort of the use of the uh, Monte Carlo in a very simple way for, for optimization. Okay. So now, I want to uh, really ask a, a seemingly very elementary question is when we do those things, we always talk about take a sample from a density or make a draw from a density. What does that really mean? Okay? You know, we, we all, well, you know, if you're using a computer, you can always say, okay, let's, let's use a software. We can draw a sample, right? But it, it's actually turned out to be quite important to understand what that really means. What do we mean by sampling from, from a distribution? Well, let me give you a complete toy example, but to illustrate the point, right? Suppose you have a distribution only takes two value. You know, uh, let's think about a biased coin. It's uh, with a tail, a quarter of probability, and the three quarter, uh, you, you get the head. Suppose you want to sample from this distribution, right? What does it mean? Now, we don't need to sample from this distribution. We can just do any kinds of analytical calculation for, you, you know, for this guy. What that really means that if you think about the reason we use a sample to represent this sort of a theoretical uh, distribution is that basically we say we want to have enough zeros, enough ones, have the right frequency, right? So all we need is a collection of these, is these numbers such that about 25% of them will be zero and about 75% will be one, right? Do you agree? If I give you, you know, 25% is 0, 75% is 1. You average all these functions, you should get the, the average, which is integration against uh, with respect to this particular density. Right? Okay. So that sounds completely trivial. Okay? Except for those who have studied statistics too much, they start to say, wait, 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 there's something wrong, right? Can I just write down 25 zeros and then 75 ones? Right? Can we just do that? I mean, that doesn't look like a random sample. Now, did we talk about things had to be, you know, in the IID samples, random sample? Can't. So there's something wrong with this, right? Okay. Well, there's really nothing wrong with it. Um, they don't have to be independent, okay? There's nothing needs to be independent. Although when they're independent, it's much easier. Which part is easier? Calculating the variance to all sorts of other stuff. When things become dependent, 
as Wei Biao just uh, talked you know, for the last 90 minutes, the mathematics become much harder, right? And the problem become much harder because, of course, you don't want to write down things, you know, just, just so dependent with, uh, with each other. You, you know, you may have problems there. But this observation that um, you don't really need the dependence actually was, is what leads to Michael J. Monte Carlo. Michael J. Monte Carlo basically said, I'm going to create this a sequence of these obse observations that I'm going to abandon the idea that they had to be independent of each other. By abandoning that, it made it much easier to create these draws. There's a price to be paid. To buy, because they are dependent, your effective sample size goes down. You think you have lots of draws, but if they're highly dependent, that means you don't have as many independent draws, right? Okay. We will see what kind of price we'll be paying in a minute. Okay. That's actually the part of the game I want you guys to, to uh, you know, play with me. But the idea of giving up the independence is what leads to this sort of Michael Chin Monte Carlo re you know, revolution. Okay. Is that, is that clear? So now, what do we mean by simulating from complex distribution? So let me show you a distribution. Well, if it's only 0, 1, it's easy, right? You, you know, trying to write down those numbers. Now let's suppose uh, we have a, a distribution which you know, is a continuous, OK? So now it's no longer that easy to write down even all the you know, num possible states, right? Because it's, it's continuous. And the form of the density could be complicated, OK? Now I'm just showing you this is a, this is a simple one. I even give you the density form, okay? This is a two-dimensional distribution. Now look carefully, and for my friend who have seen it, don't say anything, okay? For the rest, what's so special about distribution? There's something particularly intriguing about this one. Anyone want to try? It's symmetric, yes. What else? By mode, you know, obvious, right? Okay. Is this distribution? Let me give you a hint. Does this distribution have any connection with normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution? Everybody loves it. It doesn't look like Gaussian at all, right? It has two modes. It can't be Gaussian, right? But on the other hand, if you look at each component, if you look at these each component, do you see these like almost like all the Gaussian curves? Okay. So what happened is this was the distribution that, in such a way, that if you look at this expression. Right. What happened is because this cross term makes it the non-Gaussian, right? Because it's not quadratic; it has a force power. But if you condition on x, if the x is fixed, it's a quadratic in y, right? If y is fixed, it's quadratic in x, right? So both conditional distributions, by fixing one of the component, they are normal. Okay. So here is a distribution that both conditions are normal. Jointly, they are not normal. They are actually bimodal. So if you ever need a distribution to do anything real, here, you know, here's the distribution for you. Okay? You know, why do I choose that example? You will see in a, in, a, in a second. This distribution is not that easy to sample directly, but because of this conditional normality make it trivial for Gibbs sampling. That's why I choose that one. Okay? And so when we say something complex, we basically mean you know, there are two things being complex here. One is the form of the density. I can just write down any particular function as long as it integrate to 1. That's a density, positive integrate to 1. That's a density. Imagine people just give you arbitrary those things. And in fact, lots of problems we do in statistics or information or in any field that you run into these complex models, okay, and how you sample. The other problem is really hard is the dimension of the x. It's not just the form, right? You know, let's say I can tell you the form is very simple. It's a constant. It's a uniform, okay? But it's in a, like a milling dimension and with an arbitrary shape, well, that's not that easy to sample, right? So it's, it's a dimension is also decreased. So this uh, MCMC is really designed trying to tackle these problems where simple method fails, and because of the, either the form is so complex or the dimension is so high, okay? So dimension, I'm going to just talk about two dimension today. But you can see even for two dimension, life can be complicated. So what is the idea of Michael Monte Carlo? The idea of Michael Monte Carlo is really just saying, let's form a stochastic recursive, uh, recursive form. Each one depends on the previous one, but also has an independent sort of random variable here. Okay? So this is very much like what we Biao talk about, you know, these uh, nonlinear, linear, you know, he has this form. Each one is depends on the previous one, and then has an epsilon there. Okay? So that's actually identical. These are, these are, um, so what the Mykov, my, my, 
testing means, as people understand, it's just saying each one is determined by, only depends on the previous one. It does not depend on one beyond the previous one. Okay? And uh, um, so that's essentially is, is, is the stochastic recursive form. So why do we think that this is uh, very useful? That under certain regulatory conditions, and which I'm not going to tell you, and we have many experts, at least several experts in, in the audience, like uh, Galen can tell you all the things about the theory here, that you can show that if you run this thing long enough, okay, T here is a time, is iteration, its density of the, uh, of the particular you know, XT eventually is going to converge to a particular density. Okay? Therefore, if the T is run long enough, you can treat those draws as if it's the one from the, 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 the limiting di distribution. Now, in, the mo in most uh, Michael Chen Monte Carlo the statistician working on, we actually work the backwards problem. Okay? So this is saying if I, if, if I write down a sequence, a, a stochastic recursive form, and you can prove in you know, all those things, defining the stationary distribution. We are using it, the MCMC using the other way around. It's saying we give, we're given this F. The F is given. It's, it's a problem by a, by a problem. You want to construct such a chain such that this holds, okay? It's backwards. Now the problem with that is, well, it's, it's both good and bad. Uh, the good part is, you know, there are many, many ways of constructing. In fact, there's infinite many ways, uncountably infinite many ways, right? Because, you know, just, it's, uh, on the other hand, because there are infinite many ways, well, which one is better, right? You say, well, I want the fattest one. Well, even that is not as easy to think about. Well, what do you mean by fattest one, right? There's all these. Uh, total variation distance, so on and so forth, you know, come in. So, um, so the idea is you start with some, uh, you know, you, you st randomly start with somewhere, and uh, uh, you, you let it run according to this sequence, and I'm going to show you later, I'm, I'm going to actually show you some movies that you can see how the Michael Chen evolved, all right? And uh, um, the idea is that after run a while, you will discard the initial one because you think, oh, that's not good enough, they have not converged, Okay? And the whole problem is how to decide how many you should discard is actually a holy grail problem itself. And uh, um, then you sort of run longer enough, then you treat that period, you know, sort of you discard the initial one and the long run right enough, you say, well, that probably is my sample. Okay? That seems very hand waving, but it is. It is very hand waving. And it's a, the hard problem here is to decide how long it needs to be run. Now, obviously, you want good algorithms, right? Because the slow algorithms, you know, may take. Uh, you know, forever to, uh, you, you know, to run. Just to give you a, a tiny bit of sort of theory, that's the only theory I have, at least for the first part, is that you can actually mathematically or probabilistically trying to prove those things, trying to establish a bound, for example, and uh, um, you're trying to do this thing called a you know, geometric convergence, basically saying this is usually a total variation distance. You will sh show, you find the, uh, these constant depends on the starting point, and you also you know, have this row, it typically should be less than one, and has this power you know, t. So the idea here is that uh, if you can mathematically prove this equality and know what the row is, then of course you can set, you know, you can set any of the, the t according to how much, you know, how much distance you will allow and to say how long this thing needs to be run, right? Go home, problem solved. Of course in real life that to establish this bound is incredibly hard. Okay. And in fact, we have expert in the audience. Where's Jim? Jim Hover. That's right, man. Okay. So talk to him. The guy, you know, does all this incredible stuff that uh, uh, these bonds, he can tell you how hard those things are. And uh, typically, uh, for single problem, he can do it. I think Jim and others have making really big progress. But uh, still, I think, Jim, am I correct? It's still far behind the problems we can write down. You know, it just, you know, whenever problem you think you can prove, the good thing is you create infinite many thesis topics, right? Okay. It's hard, okay, to prove those things. Uh, and, you know, uh, Weibo does those things as well. Weibo can tell you how hard this is. If I just arbitrary writing down, you know, this, this, this sequence. So this has been uh, really, uh, you know, this is theoretically, uh, I've been doing lots of work, but we can't at this moment rely on the theory to tell us when to stop. That's simply... Uh, uh, will be too too limiting. Okay. 
So what we do is we will do all sorts of other, you know, diagnostic stuff. And I'm not going to tell you too much about these diagnostic stuff because it's, it's actually there are so many of them. I'm going to show you the province with, with this convergence. And I, in the second part of my talk, uh, I will uh, talk about a, a, a problem from astronomy where, where we made some progress making some sort of new contributions. So now let me start talking about, you know, Gibbs sampler. Okay. So the Gibbs sampler is, let's start talking about a, bi, a, bivari, a bivari case. Okay. Uh, in the simplest form of the Gibbs sampler, it's, it's very easy. It's just saying that I don't know how to draw from, let me see if I can use it here. Yeah. I don't know how to draw from this join one, but if I know how to draw given y, draw x, or, and I know how to draw y given, uh, given x, know how to draw x given y, then it cannot iterate between them, right? Okay, so that's the, so for the previous example I just showed you, it turns out that x given y is a normal distribution with mean and variance depends on y. y given x is normal distribution with mean and variance depends on x. Now you may see that the mean and variance actually, the mean is not linear in y, the, vari uh, the mean is not linear in x. That's because this particular problem I set up that way, it's not a usual linear regression. But it doesn't really matter for the sampling perspective, right? Because whatever y, once you have a y, I know how to draw from this normal, right? Once I have x, I have draw, draw from the other one. So you can you sort of keep you, you can keep doing this. So those for those people who have done uh, like simple gauss sido that type of deterministic you know solving equations, you want to solve an equation with two two arguments. You can't solve for both. You say, well, let's fix one, solving the other. Once you have the other, I solving this for the other. You can going back and forth, right? So this is just the stochastic version of that. Okay. And uh, just to remind people that, you know, this is the uh, normal distribution. Now, the question then is, you know, unlike the deterministic type of problem that, you know, to prove those convergence actually takes a little bit effort because it's not a convergence in points. The, the algorithm is a random, right? It's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a convergence in its distribution, okay? And the idea is that when you run long enough, this distribution, the joint distribution of x, y, is going to converge to the one right here. Okay? Got it? Okay. In fact, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how this thing works. But when I'm showing you, I'm going to show you a movie, okay? And I want you to pay attention to the following things. I'm not, uh, we're not doing that uh, performance yet, but this is the warm up, okay? So watch carefully if you want this money, all right? Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> so what I did here is this is the contour plot of that particular bimodal density. Okay? The idea is I'm going to populate here by this algorithm. This algorithm create these draws. It's going to draws are going to move around this area. The idea is if the algorithm is doing right thing, it should be more dense, have more points in the middle, less, less, because these are have less density. All right? Is that, is that clear? Okay? And to show why we use uh, uh, Monte Carlo to you know, do what? I'm going to do actually the following. For this distribution, I can actually take the margin because I, you know, it's not that hard. You can do numerically, you can find out what's the expectation of the x. That's the blue bar, okay? You, you can actually get the numerical value. What I'm going to show is as I'm making the draws, I'm going to take the sample average to estimate this guy. You will see the sample average is going to move around this thing, okay? Not only that, the, the as I advertise in the abstract, the, the greatest statistical magic is, is not just to estimate the thing. We can even do a confidence interval. Okay, so I'm going to show you a confidence interval. You will see the interval is moving around. And the interval is going to shrink as you have more sample size. Got it? That's the whole idea of taking more sample size. Okay? And I'm going to show you there will be two lines here. On the top, I'm simply take the average of these numbers, and I'm going to later talk to you about how do you construct a confidence interval, not knowing what the truth is, right? That's the whole point, right? Not knowing the truth is, but the interval itself will be moving, okay? But I also want you to pay attention that there's a bottom line. I'm doing exactly, using exactly the same data points, but there will be an interval which is much, much narrower. I want you to think about which one, how did I create the narrower ones based on this problem, okay? Is that, is that clear? All right, okay. Now, this is always the moment, you know, you do this thing, then it doesn't work. It's terrible, but let's see if it works.
So as you see, these points are start to moving around, right? Okay. And this is keep tracking how many is on above 45 degrees and below 45 degrees. Because symmetry, it should be 50-50. This is how many draws I'm making. You can see this interval practically stopped. This one's still moving. The sample mean is moving uh, you know, close to this sort of red one, and these intervals are getting smaller and, and smaller. You, you see that, right? Okay. So I'm going to show you the, the, the final results. The final result says, based on 3,000 3, draws, I am getting the, the correct value was 1.86. Based on 3,000 draws, I got the middle value is 1.78. That's the average of these 3,000 draws of the function, of, of, of the x. And the confidence interval is 1.58 to 1.9. And because I'm keep tracking, I've also tracked how many times it covered. I'm, it meant to be 95% of confidence interval, but it's, it's approximation. So we got 90, 98%. Not bad, right? Now, the bottom one you see actually has 97 percentage coverage. And in fact, that the interval is much narrower. That says bottom is using a much better estimator, right? So, so I wanted someone to tell me, what did I do for the bottom one using exactly the same data set? The whole idea here is that even with the same Monte Carlo, there are different ways of using the sample to take advantage of specialty of that particular problem. Yes. Absolutely. All I did, you're absolutely correct. Um, because this problem, both x, y is completely symmetric, right? If I have sample here, I have sample here, OK? So why not use both samples, right? Instead of average of x, I also average y. So you average both x, x plus y. The reason it makes it so accurate in this, play, in this case is because x and y's, they're, they're not independent. They're negatively dependent, right? When, when y is large, x is small. When x is large, y is small. Because of negative dependence, x plus y has much smaller variance. Much, much smaller variance because they're balanced out. Right? Okay, just to show you that, I'm going to show you the picture. That this is if you just run it by itself. So here is the density of the margin. This is one on x margin. And again, we keep tracing the mean. And I'm here I'm going to actually do the density estimator as we have more sample. And I should say that all these movies are done by my beautiful assistant, Jin Chen. And uh, he's there, and he will show up in a later, help me. And he does all these movies. So, um, so you will see. Right here, you can see that we're tracing now both the x margin and the y margin. The density estimator is all over the place, okay? And you know because they supported to converge the thing, but eventually, you know, there are all these little bumps. This is some kind of uh, what did you do? Kernel estimator, right? This type of stuff, okay? And uh, uh, but the idea is that you know uh, it's not that great. I mean, you, you have all these local bumps, everything, but you know it does try to even estimate the density itself, okay? But you can do a much better job that instead of, because if I'm interested in only estimating this mean, instead of relying on these two different uh, uh, you know, uh, distributions in, in these two different modes, what I can do is I can actually just take the sample of x plus y over 2, right? Now, the estimating the x plus y over 2, the density is much, much more stable because of what? Because of the, this negative correlation. So in fact, that I'm going to show you right here. Now you see that only with about like 100 some, the density estimator based on x plus y. Now I'm estimating the x plus y density, x plus over 2. Now you can see how nicely they are, you know, around that, uh, the mean. Okay, so you can see it's just a much easier, right? It's, it's the same program, but I'm using the property, this sort of uh, symmetry. This also illustrates this idea of called antithetic coupling. The idea if you can create two copies, to do the same thing, but they're negative correlated, you can do a better job. Okay, so it's all, all there. So I'm, I'm going to skip this one. Okay, let's just. So now let's, let me talk a little bit about the statistical inference. So far, it's all Monte Carlo. It's not really statistics yet. So how did we construct the confidence interval? Because that is actually important. If you do the naive thing, you won't get the right coverage. Okay, because these draws are dependent, right? So. What are we trying to estimate is this average of the G. Now, you just do this Monte Carlo average, right? But now, as like in Weibel's talk, these XTs are dependent with each other. Therefore, their variance, you know, we all understand when, when things are independent, 
the variance of the average is the variance of the individual divided by n, you know, the sigma square of n would be the mess. But because they're dependent, the variance is a, it's a lot more complicated formula, right? Because there's a whole, you know, the correlation, high order correlations. But approximately using the so-called autoregressive one approximation, essentially you inflate the variance by this factor, which is one plus rho divided by one minus rho. What is rho? Rho is the correlation, autocorrelation, lag one correlation between, between the immediate ones, okay? So you can see that, for example, if rho equal to 0 0.9, that would be 1.9 divided by 0.1. That means your variance gets inflated by 19 times. That's huge. So you may say, well, wait, you know, is a real problem the correlation is like, you know, 0.9? That sounds very high. Unfortunately, lots of real problems, the correlation is even higher than 0.9. Okay? And I'm going to show you. That's a big part of the, uh, part of the fun game. So, so the, the idea here is that I want you to think about... So what this says is effectively... Instead of having, if rho equal to zero, so sort of when they're uncorrelated, your sample size is, let's say it's n. When you have a correlated rho, your sample size gets deflated by, mod, by dividing this, this quantity. Okay? For example, if n is, if n is, is uh, 100, if the rho was 0 0.9, then you essentially have about 5. Because it's 100 divided by 19. You only have 5. Okay? I want, I want you to keep the formula in mind because that's how you make money, all right? I'm going to show you some movie, and I want you to guess. I'm going to show you what the sample size I'm using. I want you to guess, just a while guess, what is the real effective sample size. The formula you should in your mind is you basically try to estimate what's the correlation. You're guessing the correlation. If you guess the correlation, divide by this 1 plus rho over 1 minus rho, okay? So now once you have that thing, once you can estimate this autocorrelation, which you can use... You can use using these uh, autocorrelation, essentially just look to sample correlation. And fortunately, for these estimate called autocorrelation, they do, they are consistent, not like uh, uh, we build a much harder problem with these matrices. This is the univariate thing, so you do get this good estimate. If you have that, then you, then you can do the usual plus minus, you know, two type of thing, except you don't do plus minus two, you do this uh, T correction, the T distribution. It's because the effective sample size here could be much lower than what you have. So, you, you know, the t-correction actually matters. So instead of two, you, it could be three, all right? And the, this variance estimate essentially is, is exactly this with rows estimated by this and autocorrelation by this. I mean, there are many fancy ways of doing this. I'm doing the most sort of preliminary version, but actually it works pretty well, okay? There are all sorts of fancy ways of doing it. So you got the idea of how I'm constructing confidence interval, that the confidence interval here is basically um, by estimating the variance and then... then by estimating the uh, by estimating the autocorrelation, okay. So now you have that basic, okay. So what I'm going to do now is going to show you uh, these a few um, examples where things gets a little bit more complicated, okay. And I also want to introduce this idea of called a data augmentation, which actually is very much what I'm going to talk about in the in the in the second part. Suppose instead of the distribution we did before, suppose. Suppose let's say you want to sample from such a distribution, right? It's a one-dimensional distribution. Well, it can't be too hard to sample from a one-dimensional distribution. On the other hand, this is not a standard distribution, right? It doesn't look like a normal because you have this funky part, you know? So you may have a little bit of trouble, okay? So what's the idea of data augmentation? The data augmentation, the idea sounds, initially sounds wrong. But what we're going to do is we're basically going to create new data, right? Okay, we're basically saying, I can't solve the one-dimensional problem but I know how to solve a two-dimensional problem. That sounds like going the wrong way, right? Because you know, usually worry about the cursive dimension. But this is exactly what we're trying to go the, go the wrong way. We're saying, well, if I recognize this actually is the margin of this guy, right? Well, of course, I did that way, right? I integrate out the y, and I get that. Remember we did this problem before, right? That the Gibbs sampler, which I show you how to draw both x, y. Once you have them, you can discard the y, or you can use both of them in symmetric. You can do margin distribution. Right? Okay. But if you recognize that this guy actually is the margin of this, then you can just use Gibbs sampler to do this one, and you get the draw from the margin, right? So by going to high dimension, it looks complicated, but the idea is that when you go to this high dimension, that's a problem you know how to solve. So a lot of the work that we have been doing, I think, you know, Jim has done a lot, and I've done some, is really about how to cleverly create these sort of data augmentation. 
And the statisticians are very good of inventing data anyway. So we, we're very good of uh, come up with these models, latent variable models, you know, these are hidden, you know, if anybody doing these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, hidden Mycophon models is essentially, anytime you have the hidden state, is essentially give you a data augmentation, okay? So the idea is, again, you can simulate those things, then you can get the draws, and you get that. So this idea of data augmentation, purposely go to a high-dimensional problem where you know how to solve it, okay? And again, one, remind you, this was the density we're trying to, trying to sample from. But now, let me make things a little bit more complicated. So, so far, I've introduced the idea of a uh, Gibbs sampler. Now, I'm going to introduce the idea of Metrop hasting. Okay, Gibbs sampler really using this simple idea of like gauss sido type of thing. Okay, you know, if I can solve the problem, it, I condition on one and do the other. Right? Uh, the Metrop hasting really based on, at least at the beginning, based on a different idea. Now let's look at this distribution. What I did is, remember the previous one, I took x squared. I just did a little surgery to, to this guy, okay? I make the square into the absolute value of x. Algebraically, can do whatever you like. This is the corresponding plot of the density. Now you can see this act turned out to be much harder to sample from. First, you lose the symmetry, right? The second is, there's a teeny bump here. Most algorithms, they're going to get trapped doing this part, and they, and they should. It's trying to get the frequency right. But the problem is all the algorithms, if you design right mathematically, it will tell you that if you run long enough, it will converge. Once in a while, it will come here. But that once in a while could cost you the whole PhD duration. It could be five years. If you want to graduate, that's not a good algorithm just to wait, okay? And, and I'm not joking. If some of the PhDs you want to work on those things, if you're not careful, you're not graduating. Literally, because, you know, the algorithm, Siri said n equal to infinity. They never tell you what the exact n is, right? Okay. So we will see that actually this causing a, a sort of tremendous problem, all right? And I'm going to use this example to illustrate what I call the, the good and bad and ugly algorithms, okay? So how do I sample from this one, at least at the beginning in, in sort of theory? Well, remember that if this guy was a square, it was an easy problem, at least the Gibbs sampler. Or might be even easier if you don't have this term. Then it's, it's just a bivary normal, right? And in fact, the x, y component are independent. It's a trivial problem. So what I did is I rewrite this thing into three pieces. I write a margin of normal, margin of y, and this sort of complicated term, okay? So I write this density into three pieces. The reason I write these three pieces, I realize that I can sample from this guy, I can sample from this guy, I don't know what to do with this guy. But if I can sample from those guys, if I can try to make some corrections using this factor, I might be okay. Okay? So that's the whole idea of Machop Hastings is saying, I don't know how to solve that problem. I am going to sample from a different problem. Essentially like an important sampler. I'm going to form a ratio. And I'm going to do something with that ratio cleverly in the end that I still get the things right. Okay? That's the Machop Hastings algorithm. So let me first give you the, the sort of the uh, scary version of the metrop hasting algorithm, which is just the, just the mathematics. It said you should do, do the following. You sample something from, you, you know, you start with some random uh, uh, place. You sample from an approximate density, the Q, which is not the one you want, something else. In fact, you can even sample in a way that depends on, that the approximation can depend on where you were before, okay? So you sample from this guy, which is not the correct part. Then you calculate so called this called the Metrops Hastings ratio. You basically calculate this ratio using part of the thing, the ratio is this Q, part of the ratio is the F. Is the F is the target density you're going after. Okay, I'm gonna to explain to you why this, this form in a, in a minute. Then the idea is once you have this ratio, that if this ratio is bigger than one, you will you will always take the sample you the approximation and say that would be my sample. Okay? If this ratio is less than one, then you will accept that sample with this probability. Basically, what you do is you draw another Bernoulli, you know, then see if it's less than this number, you accept it. Otherwise, you reject it. So this so-called rejection, metrop hasting rejection algorithm. So as, as, as simple as that, okay? Oh, boy, I, I, I said it, acceptance rejection in Chinese, but, but it's the acceptance of rejection, okay? So you basically then you know, run this algorithm and discard it. Dis discard the first and zeros. So now... That's sort of the, 
did, that was the sort of general uh, um, algorithm. And let me actually give you the intuition that it helped me to learn this algorithm. Okay, this is not a proof why this algorithm worked. Uh, but it, it helped me uh, tremendously when I initially learned this algorithm. So where did this ratio come from? And how do I understand this? And for me, you know, I, if, I, if I can't explain to people, then I know I have not learned myself. So I, so I, I work hard to think about it. It turned out to be not that hard to think, at least in this uh, simple case. The reason it's called a metropolis hasting algorithm is originally the metropolis, who was this uh, physicist, uh, his algorithm actually initially have this uh, pr approximation draw is always symmetric. The one he chooses is always symmetric. Therefore, the ratio, you may remember, there's a part of the Q part dropped, okay? All you're calculating is this, the F ratio, which F is what you're targeting. So the way I understand how this algorithm works is the following. Is imagine you are here, okay? Imagine this is the previous draw, you, you are here. You draw a new draw from some other dis distribution, all right? And then you calculate the, the density of the, the new draw and the correct distribution. Okay, you can calculate the density because we assume we can formulate, uh, we, we can evaluate this F. Then you look at this ratio. Let's, then you say, well, is this guy higher than the ratio I already have, uh, the value I have here? Let's say this, suppose this ratio is two to one. Okay? What that means is, remember the very beginning I said that you just put in the right amount of zero ones? The, what's important here is not the absolute frequency, it's the relative frequency, right? I need the, I need the, uh, uh, not two to one, the, the, you know, three to one. I need the three, uh, three times ones compared to, uh, uh, compared to two zeros, right? So the idea is that if this ratio, if this is the density we are going after, if this guy has twice of ratio of this, that means for every just draw here, I need twice many of draw here. Therefore, whatever that new draw, I should include it because I need actually twice many, okay? Is that, is that clear? But what if this ratio turned out to be half of that? That means for every one here, I only need a half here. Or for every two here, I only need one, one here. Therefore, I will reject it 50% of the time. By rejecting it, I'm actually what? Controlling the relative frequency, okay? Is, that, is this clear? So all you're doing is sample from something approximate then evaluate the density values and, the, and the, compare to what you already have. See whether I should add it the in or, or re reject it depends on how frequent the one should be compared to the one I already have and the, the density I, uh, you know, I care about. Is that clear? Okay, so that's basically is the, is the, is the sort of simple version of a metropolitan haze thing. Uh, when things are not symmetric, you have to take into that account because there's a going back and forth has a different uh, Different probabilities, so it's a little bit more, a uh, little bit more complicated. So now let me show you, um, and and my two assist assistants should start to ready to. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is the following. Okay, I'm going to show you the first implementation of metropolitan hasting algorithm for this problem. Remember that that a problem I rewrite this way. So the most straightforward implementation of metropolitan hasting, and people do that all the time. Is people say, okay, let's Let's find the easiest one to, <coughs> to, to sort of implement, okay? What my assistant is doing is they're going to randomly distribute 20 of these little pieces of paper, okay? Take out a, 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 a pen, and I'm going to ask you to write down a, a number when you see the movie. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> so what I'm going to do is say, well, since I know how to draw from this guy, right? Okay? I'm just going to take normal 0, 1, or actually normal 0, 4, because, uh, uh, sorry, normal 4, 1. The mean is a 4. I'm going to take those as my as my uh, approximations. Then I'm going to calculate this metropolis. So I'm going to make a draw. I make x from here, y from here. So I get a, a pair. And then I calculate this uh, metropolis hasting ratio, which you can calculate, OK? And if this ratio is, <coughs> I draw another uniform. If this ratio is, is uh, uh, less than, <coughs> if it's bigger than one, I always accept the new one. If it's less than one, I will accept a new new draw according to this ratio. Is that clear? So this is my algorithm. Now I'm going to show you the movie. I'm going to show you the movie just like I showed you before. See how this algorithm works. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. This is now the contour plot for this new one. Remember this one is no longer symmetric? has this little mode here. Okay? And I actually have to start with n equal to 6 because this algorithm is really bad. Anyway. So this is the mean. Again, this is theoretical mean. I numerically calculated. 
And uh, <clears throat> again, there will be an interval is going to move, just like what you see before. Okay? And you will see, initially, the interval will be so wide, you don't even see them, just because this algorithm is so bad. You, know, you, don't, you, you, don't, you don't even see them. And what I'm going to ask you to do, and those people who have a piece of paper, I am going to run this for 9,000 times. 9,000 times. I want you to guess what is the real effective sample size. You, you understand the concept, right? Because they are highly correlated, it's not going to be 9,000. I want you to guess. You can guess it's you know, 5,000, whatever you like to guess. Okay? And in the end, uh, Mark and is going to collect these 20 things, and we, Jinxon is going to calculate. That's why he needs a PhD from Harvard to do the mean. He's going to calculate the mean, and we're going to see how the audience, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 do this. And if you want to play this game, you can put down your name on that sheet. Okay, you don't have to if you don't want. I'm going to choose one who get the closest, whether it's above or below, to the answer I'm going to display later. Okay, I'm going to do this three times, not for this movie. This is one movie. There's two more. There's, this is the ugly one. There's a, there's a good, there's a, there's a bad or good. And among these three, three w winners, I'm going to choose the one which get the closest to the answer and come here to play with, it, with me on this. Got it? Okay. If you want to play, put down your name. If you don't want to play, I just park it myself. So it's okay. All right. Okay. So I'm going to show the movie. All right. Pay attention. Okay. And I want you to see where these red dots are. We, we already show you there's one dot here. Okay. The dot is actually how the things is. The, the, Now you don't even see my many dots. Why? They all get rejected. Okay? See, the interval is going crazy. I already have about 3,000. Now they start to show some dots. Okay? Well, you know, it's, well, it's suddenly, it's got some moves. All right. Okay? So, let me, now you can start to, let me show you the last one just to, I don't want to review the answer yet. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So, <laughs> I, I run 9,000 time, and you see how many points was roughly there, right? Okay, I want you to write down number now for those people who have the, have the sheet. You can guess whatever you like to guess. And then um, Mark can, you can start to collect because this is a, a, a we should do it relatively quick. This doesn't. It shouldn't be that hard to write down a, a number. And Jinxon is going to do, there, there, there should be 20 of them, okay? There should be t And even, you know, we have expert in the audience. If you haven't played this one, I even want the expert to do it, if you get the, get the things, because the expert just do as badly as the non-expert. Okay? Everybody stop writing, right? Okay, now I'm going to show... Um, I'm showing the answer now, okay? And the Jinxin is going to do the quick uh, mean calculation. We did 9,000 draws. There are actually only 62 distinct values. What happened? Most of them rejected, okay? Even the 62, they were not independent of each other, right? So there's an effective sample size. So the estimate effect sample size is 23, okay? That's less than what? I can't do percentage. You guys do it. That's a negligible, essentially, right? Okay? That's pretty scary. Now, this problem, this problem, I show you what the contour is, right? Imagine the high dimension problem you're working on. You have no idea what you're doing. You, you think a 9,000 is going to work. You end up with really. Look at the estimator, right? The coverage is supposed to be 90 some, uh, 95%. It was a 41%. The reason it's get the 41 percent because initially the interval was infinity, because you know it was it, it was just terrible, right? It's that, and the estimated supposedly you see the confidence interval, well it's not surprising only 20. It, it does not even cover the cover the truth, right? Why is that? Why this one is so bad? Well, how did we propose? How do we make that approximation? We were taking from the normal with mean four variance one. 
regardless of what my previous jaw was, right? So what the proposal was always sampling around this area, which you don't really have much density to start with. In theory, it works. In theory, everything and eventually it's going to come in, right? But in reality, it's so ineffective. Most of jaws you're having, because that, that's why this so-called independence met metropolis is really bad. You're you're not even depends on what whatever the previous one was, right? Okay, you're just taking those uh, those things. So that's pretty bad. But that immediately tells you there might be a much easier, much better algorithm. It's still bad, but you know, much improved. Is do the following, right? Well, every time when I propose, can I just propose the one, you know, centered around the previous one? That seems a little bit smarter than always go back to the, the one place, right? Okay, so let's do that. So this will be the metropolis thing. It will be exactly the same thing as before. The only thing different, I'm not even changing the ratio. The ratio will be calculated. It, the only thing different is this time the proposal is essentially a two-dimension random walk. Okay? Anytime you just add this increment. Okay? This independent increment. All right? So that's the same. Okay? Then you calculate the, this metropolis hasting ratio again, and you do you do the same. You do the same thing. Okay. So now, have you get uh, the answer? What? Well, tell me what's the answer. Seventy-six hundred. All right. No, 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 no. You, you, I mean, you, you're a statistician. You should do trim mean. Okay, get rid of the outlier. <laughs> okay, so you guys did poorly. The average was one thousand. But rem, rem, uh, take the guy who has a goal, who has the closest one, if there's one right on the name. Just say that. Okay, now, uh, uh, Mark and uh, Jensen distribute another 20. 23. Okay. Distribute another 20, and hopefully don't you know don't do sample with replacement, do the do the without replacement. You know, give people who who haven't uh, who haven't played with this yet. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, you see this algorithm. The only difference is the proposal becomes a little bit clever, instead of always drawing from one single place, which does not make sense. Okay. So what I'm going to do again now, I'm going to run the movie again, and it is a new algorithm. Okay. And I want you to do exact same thing, guessing. What's the effective sample size? Remember, this audience collectively, sometimes you know the collective wisdom is wrong, is about thousand, which is way too high. Okay? And I want to see how you guys do it the second time. And I have actually have a good guess what, what's going to happen. I've done this before. I have I know the audience psych, psychology here. But get gets under the 20, okay? So I'm gonna show the movie again. This time, it populates a lot more, right? Okay. Oops, I shouldn't touch this. Now, look at how nice. You see the quality of your final estimate depends so heavily on the quality of your jaw. That's obvious, right? Now you see how nicely things being estimated. The interval is smaller. Everything, okay. Now, okay. I, there was a flash there. You guys are also learning as well, but... I have not done this carefully to cover that part, but those people were busy. Just write down your numbers, okay? So let me repeat. The two algorithm was identical in terms of the and metrop hasting ratio, everything. The only difference is how the proposal was made. Now you guys should think about why this one is still bad, okay? So uh, you finished all writing. So the, do we have the previous winner? You, you don't have to tell me who it is, but you remember, okay? Have, have, 15. Huh? 15. Oh, good. All right. So, but the difference is eight, so we'll, we'll see who gets closest. Um, all right. So, since you guys all had, uh, you stopped writing, right? Okay. So, let me just show you what the thing is. This time, there are actually about 4,000 different, different points, vastly improved. But what's the effective sample size? It's still only about 5% of the original one. Original, right? No, 400, 400 some sample size is decent. But it's nothing close to what you think, right? Because you draw 9,000, you may think about, you know, remember the previous you draw 9,000? You think it was probably 1,000, right? About 10%. But in fact, it was, you know, 23, right? Okay, it's like 0.5% or something like this. 
But now this is getting to 5%. It's still pretty scary. You think you have run milling draws? You said milling is a lot, right? Well, if you have 5% of milling, oh, it's still a lot. But, it, but it, your, your confidence should be going down pretty dramatically. Uh, and I'm, this is part I'm trying to scare all the people who have done it, you know, to say you, you make sure to probably re, re, retract some of your papers to see what happened there. Okay, so let's see what happened next. What will be an even better algorithm? Anybody can make a suggestion? Simple ones. The first one I always sample from one place. Done. The second one was a little bit clever. I goes with wherever the previous one was. Okay? But I still did something done. Which was the two directions was independent of each other. The thing was not independent at all, right? You should take you should try to move things, you know, negatively correlated with each other. Okay? So this requires a little bit more now. Suppose, you know, we actually, uh, you know, in this problem, you, you can actually run, you can run the previous algorithm if you want. You can get a quick estimate of, you know, what the correlation matrix is. That's easy. You don't need any Weibull's fancy technique to estimate the correlation matrix here because you just need some rough estimate here, okay? So now the idea is I'm still going to do the random walk, except that uh, I'm doing a random walk choosing this covariance matrix that it, you know, not making them independent, right? Making them sort of depend, negatively dependent. There, this is a 1.2 factor here. This is this is from the more deep theory about you know how far you should uh, uh, move to uh, um, sort of maximize the speed. There, this uh, what will be the the uh, you know acceptance rate? Okay, so so this is what we do. Okay, so everything else is a, is identical except the proposal now is a little bit smarter. Okay. Now, Jington, what's the, what? 1,800. There's outliers again? <laughs> All right, okay. There are some, some of you are just way too optimistic, you know. It just, um, <clears throat> and you're living in California. Maybe you're not. So um, anyway, so these are probably not from California. Um, All right. So I'm going to show you what the answer is. And I already show you it's 400. Right? So you're, you're wrong again. Can you please get it right the next round? Okay. So who, who gets closest to that one? 400, three people? All right. Okay. We, we, we could have some fun later. Okay. Good. So these people are good people. Um, <laughs> so now I'm going to implement again. All right. This time, last row. Yeah. Now I really give those people who are dying once the same because. They didn't get it twice. Yeah, did you guys sample the front row at all? No, no that's bad. Okay. That, so you, you, you did a cluster sampling, which is bad. You, know. you should have done stratified sampling. Um, okay, maybe a little bit more here. You know, just, you know. Here, okay. All right. I'm going to show you a movie again. Now you should know how to play this thing, right? And the, please, somebody get close to be right. Now, not somebody, the, the whole audience. Okay. Now we will see that the things gets um, much better. A lot more points here, okay? And uh, again, I'm doing 9,000. You know, things looks looks nice. Okay. And uh, um, hopefully, the effective sample size should go up. The question is, go up by by how much? Okay. You probably should close eye when when the flash. You don't see the answer. Okay, good. <laughs> so the first time, the correct answer is about 20 something. You guys said 1,000. The second time, the correct answer is about 400 something. You guys said 1,800. Do I see a train? Yeah. Okay. This time, I see what you get. All right. And this will be the last round.
All right. I'm going to show the answer now. And uh, um, the factor of sample size is about 800. Still less than 10%. This is a pretty decent algorithm now. It's by no means it's optimal. There's no such thing called optimal here. The optimal will, will be sampling from itself, ID draws. Even that is not optimal. because You can make a negative dependent. You know, it depends on what you're, what you're doing. Okay? But this is pretty decent, right? Because you're taking a location, you do things. Imagine in, in real life, the problem you're working on is a lot more harder than this. You probably started with something very naive, something simple to do. You do something clever, a little bit clever, you know, depend on the previous one, do some rotation stuff. This is probably, this, this sophistication probably representing a, a, a decent average sort of user. I mean, there are a lot of fancy algorithms there, okay? You still get about 10%, right? Why? Because of high correlation. The correlation is pretty high, okay? So now, uh, we, we're waiting for, um, for the answers here, okay? And uh, um, so again, you know, for those people who, uh, uh, let me tell you a story when I'm waiting. One of my students, I was actually my last student at the University of Chicago, he was doing this uh, uh, fancy, you know, hyper-tempering stuff, and he ran this algorithm. He came back to me after a week. He said, you know, I run 10,000 draws. I said, no, go back. Okay, the 10,000 draws is definitely not, a, uh, not enough. He said, you know, I need to graduate. I said, sure, just go back, run. Okay, just run fast. Um, so after another week, he comes back around 100,000. He said, 100,000 should be enough. I look at it. I had a gut feeling. The problem was pretty complicated. I said, no, 100,000, you cannot graduate. He said, how would you know? How would you know 100,000 is not enough? You know, every plot, you know, you did all the trace plot, which I'm going to show you some. Looks very nice. I said, no, just go back to, to run it. Okay, I don't trust this without. I sort of had some gut feeling it's not right. After another two weeks, he comes back. He said, Charlie, how did you know? I said, what happened now? Okay. He ran 375,000 draws. Then suddenly, uh, I'm going to show you this trace plot, not this one, but it, everything looks very nice, convergent. Then after 375,000 draws, shh, it shifted to some other region. Right? Then I told him, now you can graduate. Okay. <laughs> All right? Because, you know, and it's scary. Most people don't run that long. Okay? And, uh, you know, you know I'm saying this is, is not just trying to scare you, but it, it re this is a really powerful thing. But like anything else, when it's powerful, it can be easily abused and can easily uh, in, in, uh, misused. Particularly, it's easy to, re to do. So definitely do all these diagnosis stuff. You know, do running multiple chains, not just running one, because if all converge, they shouldn't det depend on where the starting point is. If multiple chains go into multiple different places, you have a, pro you have a problem. There are all these fancy uh, you know, diagnostic tools. There are quite a few experts in the audience to do, do those things. And so just don't do the simple one. Say, you know, I would, if I referee a paper doing MCMC, I'm, I'm just going to reject the paper if the paper just say, you know, I run at uh, 100,000, that, that looks enough. <laughs> That's definitely not enough. You know, show me some evidence. Okay? So, um, all right. This audience is just so optimistic. <laughs> there's, a, there's a one person who got a 795. Uh, 795. Okay, so this person, what? <laughs> what? What is that? Oh, you mean somebody cheated. <laughs> You're just, uh, okay, at least this guy was clever. That's how you make money at, at, at Wall Street. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's okay. But, uh, uh, well, I, I'm still going, well, whoever this person is, that, uh, do we have a name? All right. W where are you? Oh, good. Okay. No, 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 not yet. I want to see how clever you are when you play Monty Hall with me. All right? Okay. So I'm not just giving up the money right away. So, you know, I have, uh, it's good that you got it exactly right, which is suspicious, but, <laughs> but, but, but we can play those things, see, see how good you are. Okay. So, um, so the point here is that, if you're just trying to implement those algorithms, you know, without thinking that you can really run into serious, serious problems. So what we're going to do now, it's time to introduce the stars, okay? And what do I mean by introduce stars? Because now I'm going to talk about in the next, oh, well, this is good to have 90 minutes. I still have a half hour. Um, to talk about this particular algorithm, the general sort of strategy we developed, uh, a few experts in the room have certainly heard about it. 
And uh, I'm going to, uh, introducing uh, this, the stars referring to all the astronomy problem we've been doing. And this is from this uh, California Harvard Astronom uh, Astronomy Statistic Consortium. And uh, um, these are the current members. I'm one of them. And the particular work I'm going to present is with Yaming Yu from UC Irvine. I don't think Yaming is here. Is Yaming here? Not yet. OK. And, uh, uh, but we actually have some, you know, when you introduce star, you need some cool pictures. I'm actually going to really show a, a really cool picture of a star. And he's actually in the audience. David. David, are you there? Yeah. The reason, I mean, the reason I show David is David, David is my first student, and he's the one really uh, started this whole uh, this, this, this uh, astronomy you know, uh, consorti consortium, and uh, uh, we have been doing lots of work, and the, this is actually really, it, it was a problem that from astrophysics where um, Yaming was struggling with it, and he came up with a very clever idea, a very simple idea to deal with this, this computational problem, and it turns out that it's, it's sort of just not a, a, a trick for this particular problem. So my contribution to this work is really sort of recognizing this whole thing is, is much more general. And it turns out it has all sorts of cool connection with things, for example, Jim, you know, Jim Hope was doing. And so it's, 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 it's just wonderful. So now let me switch to the other. All right, now it's a little bit more scary. Uh, and this particular paper I'm talking about uh, is going to come up in JCGS, the Journal of Competition Graphic Statistics. And it's going to be a discussion paper. I think uh, we have a, at least a one, dis two discussions in the, in the audience, Jim and his student, and probably others. I don't know. Maybe even referees. And, um, <laughs> and uh, um, let's see. So the idea here is that uh, this thing we call the ancillary and the sufficient interweaving strategy has a very cool uh, name called the you know, acronym as is. So use at your own risk. Um, <clears throat> so la let me show you what this uh, particular, uh, how did we start it with this uh, uh, saying. I'm not going to be able to talk about this whole talk. You see, I borrowed this, this uh, slides from the talk I gave at the George Mason itself. This talk itself is one hour, but I'm going to do uh, about you know, half of it, introduce the general idea. The particular problem we were working on, I should say Yamin was working on, was to, uh, to uh, detect to, to, this is the, these are the photons from this particular star, and uh, um, you know, these are time beings, and within each uh, beings, you can consider them as uh, you know, Poisson uh, observations. And the astronomer uh, friends or colleagues want to know, is there anything changing over the time, right? So you know, these, are, these are individual ones are Poisson cons, and they told me, don't worry, but don't argue whether it's Poisson or not. It is Poisson. So, okay, let's assume it's Poisson. It's all the physical process. These are, these are pros and cons. And the, they want to see is say, well, over this time period, these are like, you know, second, is there any changes? This is like a testing case, the real problem they want to work. They also want to see whether there are particular, uh, you know, something happens, maybe there's some flare, you know, some, some gamma rays, all, all, all this stuff. Now, I guess you don't need to anything fancy that most of you look at this thing, what would be your conclusion? Is there anything changing over the time? No. Right? I mean, you know, you don't need anything fancy. The only problem with that is you can't send a paper to Nature and say, "I look at nothing really going on. Publish it." <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way, right? <laughs> so they come to us and say, "Okay, can you sort of do some statistical, complicated analysis to show there's nothing going on?" <laughs> okay. No, nothing going on is, is not necessarily bad, right? You know, there's you know sometimes you know nothing going on is is absolutely great. So, uh, right? Okay, so. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, at that point, I didn't really know anything about modeling data like this. This is essentially a Poisson you know, time series, right? And, and they, the astronomy friend told us that the, all these beings, the, the, these draws are independent of each other. I said, okay, now if they're all independent of each other, the only thing I can model is the underlying in intensity, right? I can model the underlying intensity, so see if the underlying intensity actually goes up, changes with time. Okay, so the model I suggest um, uh, Yaming to fit was this simple sort of time series model, which actually has a later I learned has these uh, cool names called the parameter driven. So what it does is simply say, uh, pretending that the underlying intensity itself is a time series, you do not observe that, and that the underlying intensity itself is modeled as an AR1 process. Okay, 
You can think about it where being a basin, where it's sort of a putting a pry on the underlying intensity. Okay? And then we model the log of intensity just to make everything positive. And this D here is the width of the bin. Because you know, obviously the bin's larger, you have to have more, more sort of draw. These are all known. So what we did, it was a pretty simple. We said the log of intensity is a linear function of t, and that the game is to trying to see if the beta one is equal to zero. But uh, because the you know, intensity, we want some smoothness, right? Intensity shouldn't just jump all over the place. So we basically using the autoregressive model to model, model this sort of uh, uh, you know, dependence to, to introducing this, this sort, of, sort of smoothness. Now, since I don't really work on, at least at that point, this was a couple of years old uh, initially, actually more than a couple of years ago, Yami had graduated for a few years, that you know, I, didn't, I didn't work on time series problems, so you know, I just thought that was sort of an obvious model. Uh, later I learned this model actually is a special case of the Cox process. It's actually very useful for, like, you know, for the, in the finance to, to estimate the, the default rate you know, all, all sorts of cool applications, you know, so on and so forth. But the first was, was just a simple model, trying to see is there any evidence that this beta uh, deviates from zero, okay? So once you write down this model, and uh, so, you know, since we were, you know, we were sort of basing, we say, oh, let's just do the basing. We put down a bunch of prize, we do this and that. And I, since, you know, Yaming was uh, working with both uh, uh, um, uh, David and, and myself, and it's easy for the professor to tell students, okay, just, just run the Gibbs sampler because everything looks sort of trivial. And in fact, you can easily write down what the Gibbs sampler is. It looks a little bit more scary than, than it really is. In this case, um, if, you pretending, if you pretend the underlying time series is known, if you pretend the, the intensity is the, that's the data augmentation idea, if that is observed, then you can easily uh, estimating the beta and estimating all these other parameters, because one is equivalent to the Poisson generalized linear model, the other is equivalent to fitting a Bayesian sort of L1 model, okay? If you pretend that the intensity is known. But the intensity is not. That's the other step. That's the, that's the step that you draw the intensity given all these, all, all these parameters. So here we're doing the Gibbs sampler in the following way. You have a problem, you have a bunch of parameters you want to draw given the data. That's the, a that's the Bayesian solution. You want to do the posterior, draw the parameter given the data. That's too hard to do. You say, well, let me pretend I have more data. That's the, that's the idea of data augmentation. The more data here is pretending the underlying intensity itself is known. Okay? If that's known, the, the, the C is known, then join the parameter given both the intensity, uh, both the C and the, uh, and the observed data is, is trivial. It's quite trivial. But you don't know the uh, observed, uh, missing data, right? So you do the other Gibbs sampler, which is draw the missing data, pretending the parameter is known and the observed data is known. You iterate, in the end, it, it gives you the right answer if you do the right algorithm, okay? So that's the general, how the Gibbs sampler becomes so popular in this type of problem, okay? So, you know, it's easy for me to say because in this case, you can just write down all these steps are standard, you know, for, at least for statisticians, it's easy to, to, to do. So let's just look at how this algorithm works. Since for the real data, we don't know what the truth is, we say, well, let's run a simulation where we know what the, all these two parameters are, and then let's see how these, how, you know, how these things works. Well, when you run those things, you see it's not really working. So now, what do you mean by not really, really working? This is so-called the, these are trace plot. This is the number of iteration, and then we trace, trace that the Michael Chan, remember the movie I show you? I was showing the, the two-dimensional. This is just showing the one dimension, how the, how the thing's moving. Now, for those of us, anytime you see those things, you know the algorithm is, is not working. What, what do you mean by not working? Because it's very, very sticky, right? It's, it has a high dependence, okay? What you like to see is things like this. What you like to see is it has been like, oscillating, explore that area. But these are all the scary part. You see the thing moving, you know, like here, this part looks like pretty nice. The delta is estimating, seems like pretty nice, but after 2,000 draws, it, it, it sort of shifted. But how do you know it's not gonna shift again? You don't, right? You can pray, but you know, pray sometimes works. Depends how hard you pray, uh, and and you know so you don't you don't know right okay so this is basically and the, and the Yami have shown me many of those different the simple Gibbs sampling in this case simply does not work does not work, work in the sense that Yami won't be able to graduate with a reasonable amount of time it's it's going to work for it eventually right and uh, so Yami come up with a very clever idea okay and I'm going to spend the next five minutes five to ten minutes or so 
to explain this sort of general scheme uh, built upon what he, what he discovered. Okay. So the idea of the data augmentation is, is in a more formal way is the following. Suppose the Y ops is what you want, is the observed data. Remember, these are the photon counts. The C are the parameters you want to make inference about. And if you're being, doing a Bayesian, you do the posterior, which is likely to multiply by the pry. Don't worry if you're not a Bayesian, you just you know, take the pry as constant. You just do the likelihood, okay? So that's the, you don't have to debate about the, the, the philosophy here. And the idea here is, doing the Gibbs sample, is the data augmentation says, if I don't know what the, I don't know how to deal with this problem, but if you give me more data, the problem becomes easier. So this is why you know, to statisticians, going high dimension is a very natural one because you know, give me more data, the problem is a bit easier. That's the, you know. And so the only restriction on how do you augment is that after you integrate out this guy, you will go back to the original problem. So these data are introduced purely for the purpose of computation. You're not altering your original model, okay? But how do you create them has all sorts of uh, uh, all sorts of trick, and this particular trick I'm going to talk about is really about how do you uh, how to make things efficient. So what the Gibbs sampler does is now, as I described before, you draw the missing data given the observed, given the parameter. You draw the parameter given the missing data, given the observed. You alternating between these two, and eventually, if you're lucky enough, you know things converge, and you will get. Then you take the draws of the theta, and that's from from this particular uh, distribution. Okay. The work that uh, uh, David and I did, this is now well, more than a decade ago when David was still a student at the University of Chicago, is that we started playing with this idea is that when you're augmenting the data, there's nothing uh, prevent you to create additional parameter. This is sort of sounds crazy. I'm going to be introducing non-identifiable parameters, okay, to index this, this uh, augmented model as long as that parameter does not show up in my observed data. Okay, so the idea is, since I'm augmenting data, why not I'm even augmenting parameters? That sounds even crazier. But the reason we do that is, once you have that augmentation indexed by alpha, for each given alpha, it is a legitimate algorithm. Then I can choose among the alpha, using some criteria, to get the best algorithm. Okay, so it's, the idea was not just creating one algorithm, create a bunch of algorithm. And then you have some criteria to, to choose one. And this is the work that uh, uh, you know, David and I, we, we, we did, and others uh, as well at the same time. We did the efficient data augmentation. We, first of all, we did this, this thing called a conditional data augmentation, meaning we're going to try to find the optimal alpha, then we're given that a value, we just run this algorithm. Later we realized, well, you know, since we're Bayesian, right, we can even put the pry on the artificial parameter we just created. There's nothing to stop you do that. And it turned out that's actually very important. This is called the marginal data augmentation. And there's a deep theory uh, developed by Jung Liu, and uh, many of you may know some of my colleagues uh, work a lot on Monte Carlo as well, and Ying Yan Wu at the UCLA. They basically did develop this sort of group theory-based theory that to prove why this type of algorithm is optimal among a certain class of the uh, uh, you know, a data augmentation algorithm. But the question uh, was always, that if you're doing these conditional, uh, regardless of which way you're doing, in a, in a way, you're always choosing one algorithm. So later, the thing Yaming did, retrospectively, what he did is he, he basically said, you know, let's don't choose one algorithm. I have a bunch of algorithms. Is it possible that I use two algorithms or use more than an algorithm in some, in some clever way that actually turned out to be better than just choosing the optimal one? Okay? That sounds like seems impossible, right? If it's the optimal, it should beat everyone. Well, you beat every single one, okay? You're not necessarily beating combining algorithms. So this is a, a coming, now I'm gonna illustrate this whole idea. I think I probably only have time to, to, show, um, to show this sort of uh, you know, toy example. So I'm gonna do this, uh, the simplest example, which is the uh, one-dimensional uh, random effects model with one observation, okay? As simple as you, the idea here is that uh, you, know, you observe y, theta is a parameter, z is this sort of random, uh, random effects or latent variable. Uh, you do not observe z, but uh, you know its distribution is normal zero with, mean, with variance sigma, uh, with variance tau square. To make life simple, I even assuming tau square is no, okay? So in this case, that if I have a, a sort of non-informative prior for, for theta, you can find the posterior, which is simply this normal. You don't need anything fancy, right? The reason you do that is, is because we know the we know we know the answer, we can look at 
uh, you know, compare different algorithms and, and see how they do. So what's the idea of the, uh, these two different algorithms? What we're going to do is we're going to do this thing called a sufficient data augmentation. So what do I mean by that? Well, here, when you look at this uh, equation, Y is observed. Both theta and Zs are observed. Well, there's nothing stop you to treat theta plus Z as missing data itself. Both are unobserved to treat them as, as missing data. If you do that, what happens is this missing data itself, because theta is a part of it, if you know missing data, the observed data has no information about theta whatsoever because you already take a theta as part of the, 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 the missing data. So this is what we call statistically the missing data becomes sufficient, meaning that it, that's all you need to know. If you had the missing data, the observed part in, provides no additional information. If you take that theta, if you take that as a missing data, you can write down the Gibbs sample. You have this, you know, this simple normal calculation that will give you an, an algorithm. But there's nothing to stop you to say, well, I don't want to do this. I want to take the Z itself as a missing data. You can do that too. Now this time the Z becomes so-called ancillary. What is ancillary? Ancillary to me here means because the Z distribution here itself has nothing to do with. I should stop playing with this. Actually. The Z distribution itself has nothing to do with theta. So that, that's the technical term is Z is the ancillary statistics for, for the theta. So you can either do the, do the sufficient one or you can do the, do the ancillary one. You can write down what these condition distributions are. Each one of them gives you an algorithm, okay? So to make life simpler, this, this looks pretty complicated. What I'm gonna do, and there's, there's one thing you have to remember. These two data augmentations, one is the a sufficient one is ancillary. They actually have a one-to-one -one trans one -one correspondence by this sort of uh, transformation. What I'm doing now is going to write down, remember at the very beginning I talk about MC, MC at the recur stochastic recursion. In single problem like this, you can write down what the recursion is. You have these two steps, you can plug in. So what happened is, this is the actually how the sufficient augmentation works. You make a draw, if this is previous draw, then you make a normal zero one, and you do this calculation, that gives you next draw. That's corresponding to that particular algorithm, that Gibbs sampler, okay? You can write it down specifically. And so now, why I write down this one? Well, what it control the, the speed of this guy? Remember the whole thing is about making them less dependent. The dependence between C dot T plus one and the C dot T is all governed by this guy, how large this guy is. If this thing is close to one, then the thing is essentially not moving, right? Essentially just stay there. If this guy is close to zero, essentially saying it's independent of the previous one, okay? So you can see for, for this algorithm, when tau is large, it's gonna be a great algorithm because this thing is gonna be small, okay? So for this algorithm, you can actually show the geometric rate is this guy, okay? This is a, you know, it, it's not hard to, to show that geometric rate is this guy. So this algorithm is fast when tau square is large. What about the other algorithm? you can write down the, the ancillary one, you can write down this way. This time the coefficient is actually one minus of this guy. So now this guy is small when tau square is small. So this algorithm is good when tau square is small. And I have two algorithms. Depends on the value of the tau. If the tau is large, I should choose this one. If the tau is small, I should choose this one, right? Sounds good. So one problem in practice, you don't know what the tau is. You can do some pre-runs, you know, you're trying to figure them out. And the people debate about, uh, you know, this is this actually corresponding to things called a centering and the non-centering. That's a part of the title I'm going to say a little bit more uh, later. So people had a desire to say, well, is there some way of choosing the algorithm will be automatically combining this feature? It sort of knows it. You know, when it's when tau is large, choosing one, when tau is small, choosing the other one. So you don't have to do, you know, those things. Well, at least there is one simple one. There's a very simple idea here. The very simple idea is simply alternating between these two algorithms. So what do you mean by alternating between these two algorithms? You draw C dot T, you got the C dot T plus one, you don't put it back here, you put it back here. You get this one, and you put it back here, right? So nothing stops you doing that. And because each algorithm can reach the right distribution, you can actually show that it is actually a legit algorithm, okay? And you can even show its rate, although it's a little bit complicated to calculate the rate, because this algorithm, the alternating one, will be taking two step, two step, is like four step. So how do you count this thing? So roughly you can count in a way, 
the, these two step, if you count the two step, two step, it's really convergence, it's really the product of, of these two. So that is actually compromises. If you want to be fair, you probably can take a square root of it. So it's not entirely fair, but you can think about the square root is sort of the rate of these, uh, these uh, alternating algorithms. So the, so the interesting part is that there's actually, um, wait, how much time I have? We started what? We didn't start at 10.30, right? Gosh, I already ran out of time. You guys still sitting there, very quiet. Okay, good. All right, so I should wrap up. So uh, let me let me say because I was thinking like at twelve. So sorry about that. I guess you guys want the lunch, and so uh, is it is a lunch good lunch? Otherwise, we can skip it. It's a good lunch. Okay. Okay. All right. So I I do quickly. We still need to play the whole Monty Hall. You know this the whole thing. And uh, but let me say just very quickly what this idea is. Then I'm going to skip in much of detail. The origin alternating algorithm essentially is saying run run A B run A prime and B prime. You're basically saying run this, run that. Okay? You alternate it. Right? It turned out that the best thing to do is not to do that. Is rather, instead of running all these four steps, you take one of them, you insert it in, in between them and don't run the other one. You instead of doing two two four steps, you're actually doing three steps. Okay? And it, there are two ways of doing it. They're, they're, the algorithm, the speed is a little bit different. But they're, they're, in this case, no matter how you do it, what happened is I'm going to, because of time, I'm just going to tell you that in this case, if you do that, it actually creates IID draws. So what I mean by IID draws, it actually creates independent draws. That sounds like a magic. All right. So because of time, I'm going to skip all these, all these details, and I'm going to tell you why, why it actually creates, creates independent draws. It turned out these rate of convergence, as I show you uh, before, don't worry about these details. The rate of a convergence of this new algorithm, it was controlled by the, the rate of convergence of the or original algorithm, one algorithm, two algorithm, and by the maximum correlation between these two data augmentation schemes I just created. Okay? And it, it turned out that if you do right with the sufficient and the ancillary, these two data augmentation schemes you created for this particular problem, they're actually independent for each other. Okay? Therefore, their correlation is actually zero. You actually break down, break down their, their, uh, their correlation. That's what makes the algorithm fast. I'm giving uh, this lighting faster sort of thing. But let me skip up most of the thing. I'm just showing you how this thing worked. All these details. Okay? I'm going to show you now. This, this is thing starts working. Okay? With all this stuff. I'm going to show and a bunch of, and we did a different things showing you. If you only do part of things, it will not work. If you do everything, it work. But let me, let me show you in the end what's the result, right? Because that's, that's what you care about. Um, remember what I sh show you guys? You know, the thing seems like nothing going on, right? So after all this work, after PhD thesis, we proved that nothing's going on, right? Now, in fact, the posterior distribution of the beta one is nicely centered around zero, okay? No evidence whatsoever the beta one is, is different from zero. So that's good, right? Because that's sort of confirmed. Thing, okay, but so and and we also look at the correlation. You know, these are the look at other stuff, and this is the so this is sort of like you know in the end is like uh, you know uh, much to do you know anything right? There's nothing nothing going on, but what we get out of this thing is really this general idea that don't just use one, using two, but in this very clever way, not doing this sort of alternating, but doing this thing what we call interweaving. Okay, and there's a deep theory. I think Jim has to develop even further theory to explaining why those things work. Jim, are you going to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, Jim. So tomorrow, uh, Jim can you know explain to you uh, uh, more. And so, um, so let me see that that I'm going to conclude in the following way that for you know we do need to, you can come over. I can come over and and uh, Jim, so you're going to help me here. Now you guys know this whole Monty Hall problem, right? Okay. So this I have three envelopes here, okay? One of them contain money, one of them contain a piece of advice, and you you standing there. Don't don't too close to me. Just standing there, okay? <laughs> and one of them contains my uh, you, you know my business card. So Jinsen, you can help me here, okay? Can I see a word? Huh? Can I see a word? Yes, sure. Uh, because I'm a little bit of this your talk. Yep. Uh, uh, worth taking now uh, to take your last one. Good. That's really. Oh, good. <laughs> At least he's honest, so he can work on, on Wall Street. Uh, come here. <laughs> okay. 
So what I'm going to do is, this is the standard Monty Hall problem, right? There's a probability here. Is I'm going to ask you to, okay, you hold these two. Just, just don't, don't, don't do anything. Tell him which one you will pick up, to, uh, left or middle and the right. Any. No, no, just tell, tell him which one. Middle. middle one, okay. So, so he pick up the middle one, right? Okay, so take the middle one. I am going to, in these two pieces, I'm going to eliminate the one which does not contain, con, contain money. Okay? And this one does not contain money. Let me make sure that it does not contain money. Otherwise, all right. So now, the question to him, do you want to keep you the original one or you want to switch to this one? I didn't see that, so I didn't see that. He wants to still keep that one, okay? So this is the Monty Hall problem. The, the question is, does by switching increase the chance? Let's see how it works. You want to keep the original one? Take the original one. What, what's inside? Uh, yeah. Well, you need to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> and this one has $31. Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You should have switched, right? <laughs>